Hello, and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Diamond Wong Kuo from the U.S. Census Bureau. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome to this special podcast episode. In this episode, we hear a story of corporate bullying and how it can lead to suicide and thoughts of suicide. I cannot thank Diamond enough for getting vulnerable with us and trusting us with her story. We just so appreciate it. And if you're ever having thoughts of suicide, please call 988 in the United States or your local suicide hotline. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Diamond Wonko, an Emerging Technology Fellow at the U.S. Census Bureau. Diamond, hello and welcome. Hey, nice to see you and Happy New Year. (laughs) Happy New Year. Um, So I'm excited because this is actually the second time you are joining us to be interviewed, which is a first for us. So that is very exciting. But before I get into why I invited you back, let's talk a bit about where you are now as you have a new role since we've last talked. Uh, And just a refresher, uh, when I met you, we were, uh, I was looking for a speaker on data quality and you were introduced to me as having given the best data quality talk. And, and as you know, and, and as I got to know you, I know that data quality is just your jam. Like that is just (laughs) your thing. I think it's quality in all aspects. Quality is my jam, man. I'm one of those weird people. (laughs) So tell me, so tell me what you're doing now for the U.S. Census Bureau and what your week's yeah. looking like. So um, last year I was selected um, as one of six Americans to be a uh, part of the Emerging Technology Fellowship. And essentially it's helping the Bureau and um, agencies connected to the Bureau um, to adopt and learn about emerging technology. So um, some folks are dealing with AI ML. Um, others are dealing with private, privacy enhancing technology. Um, I am dealing with data modernization. So um, much like a lot of organizations right now going from on-prem to a cloud environment, uh, that's what I'm trying to do here at the end uh, at the census, but it's more on an enterprise level. So um, that is what I'm doing. That's very cool. I mean, I have to assume there's, I mean, there's a lot of data there. Yeah. Yeah, like terabytes of data um, and moving that from, again, an on-premise server to a cloud is is very challenging from like, when I was in consulting, we were just doing these pretty simple lift and shifts. But when you think of something with the amount of data and the, the types of data, it is, it is a huge project. Oh, well, congratulations. That is very Thank exciting. You. So fun. And so, and just again, a little refresher on your background. Um, So you have a bachelor's degree in what? So my bachelor's is in industrial engineering, and then I got my master's in quality systems management. That's amazing. And how many certifications do you have? Too many to name. (laughs) But the main ones that I like, uh, I'm a lead auditor for AS9100 and ISO 9001. Um, I'm a product owner, Scrum Master, um, so those are the cooler ones, and more to come. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. Okay, so in addition to working at the U.S. Census Bureau, you, um, uh, I see on your website, diamondwilliams.me, you list yourself as a senior data engineer and data analytics educator who's passionate about equality for black talent, exposing minority communities to data literacy and helping with career navigation. Tell me a little bit about that. 
Oh, man. Um, so I'll start with the career navigation and kind of build up. Um, so I'm a first gen college graduate and first in engineering and all of it. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's one thing to have these conversations of go to college. OK, I go there. Now what? Um, so I kind of like bang my head against the wall all throughout college, just trying to find what's my thing. Um, so I, I had like five different internships for Fortune 500 and 100 companies. And that kind of helped me uh, learn that I like quality, I like process improvement, and I like um, the data that surrounds those two topics. So um, that allowed me to kind of always be forward thinking when it comes to the applications of data and like issues that will come um, based on like of my background. So what that looks like is like, I started out in industrial engineering and quality, but I got a lot of projects that were data centric that allowed me to pivot into data engineering. And now I'm doing data engineering and it's allowing me to learn more about AI, ML and data science. So um, just that ability to always see how there's a quality linkage throughout all of these like um, up and coming trends and technologies. At the end of it, it's always gonna have some quality component and I'm very grateful to be able to like use that to navigate in these spaces. So that's what I hope to offer people there. Um, data literacy, um, as you probably see daily, there's something technology data driven and to be able to not only understand the conversation, but participate in the conversation, you have to know something about data. So um, that's where the data literacy um, and education comes in. Um, I'm an adjunct instructor for Maryville University, uh, part of their graduate data and analytics program. So just helping um, students become more data literate and understand how to um, be data driven in this world. So that's kind of like why that bio is summed up that way. Well, amazing. So, and you mentioned that you at, at you are an adjunct instructor, and also now, in addition to all of that, you are also uh, a self-employed for principal quality specialist for Quality Arrow Systems. So, tell me a little bit about yeah. that. So, Quality Arrow Systems is my baby that um, I hope to be birthing very soon. Um, essentially, I want to focus on again, just data and quality in the areas that that impacts. So that looks like traditional quality, where that's your QMS, AS9100, ISA9001, then your data quality. So that's the next layer. You have your standard traditional quality, your data quality. And what I'm learning more about is uh, data ethics, which is like a quality component of how the data is stored and interacted with from an algorithmic auditing standpoint. So I'm trying to build on all of the layers of how quality impacts these places differently. Oh, I love that so much. Thank oh you. my gosh. So, you know, you, you just, do you sleep? You, Cause you're also, you know. No. <laughs> no, I have a toddler. She cares nothing about sleep. I was gonna say you're a mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes oh, she I... does not care. <laughs> you also are, um, list yourself as an author. Tell me about that. Yeah. So um, during my master's in quality systems management, again, I was able to kind of see how data is going to, our quality impacts data. And that led me to um, publishing an article on um, data quality management for industry 4.0. And I essentially looked at um, all various types of literature about data quality and how um, data quality management uh, is impacted in this new space, which is like your industry 4.0. Um, and essentially what that looked like is learning how quality is continuing to evolve and touch all these spaces when um, for a while, quality was just looked at the gatekeeper um, within a business. So it's like, I'm going to design something. We'll check the quality once we're right at the door. But now the, the concept of how can we maintain quality throughout um, your data, your enterprise, whatever system that is, and being able to see how quality is continuing to transform and grow uh, definitely helped me 
understand how do I want to represent quality as well as how do I want future diamond, future businesses to interact with quality? That's such an important thing. And, uh, you know, especially as we get into generative AI and that becomes has become a mainstream term, uh, data ethics, right, goes right along with that. And I love that you're looking at that. So you are a very, very busy woman. <laughs> so yes. impressive. Um, really Im impressive. And I will post the link to your to the previous podcast interview so you, everybody can get a in-depth mm -hmm. uh, catch up on, on how amazing you are and the career you've had. But okay. let's get into why I invited you back. So I asked you back because you have a hard story to share, a story that's not unique to data professionals, but I think one that impacts us all, right? And is and as this podcast is, the intent of this podcast is to help data professionals' careers be a little bit easier. I believe it's important to share these hard things and talk about how we can help each other just be better. Yeah. So recently I... um. I saw you repost the story regarding the death of Dr. Antoinette Candia Bailey, AKA Bonnie. She was a black woman who was the vice president of student affairs at Lincoln University, Missouri. And she reportedly committed suicide from quote, bullying and severe mistreatment end quote by the president and other leadership at the university. So first, for those who are unfamiliar, can you tell me a little bit more about this story as you understand it? Yeah, um, I I think the summary that you gave was how I learned of the story as well. Um, and I just kind of researched it. I, I just was captured by it because I had experienced similar things and um, I understood her decision um not that no I, I don't think any person um wakes up wanting that but I feel like at some point you get to this space where it feels like you're boxed in and, and that's the only solution um and it, it's it's difficult right and um again I, I don't think any person just goes in wanting that but once you're, you raise the flag so many times and nothing's changed, it's just like, maybe I'm the problem and, and maybe I should um, eliminate myself from the problem. Um, and that's, some people choose to do that by leaving and, you know, find another job or whatever. And then other people, not, not that they're weaker or whatever, they just, everyone has the moment where they get, to I can't take it anymore and that's expressed mm -hmm. differently so seeing that um really resonated with how I felt um when I was at a, a particular job and just really debated on like how can I just get relief I just want the pain to go away so when you did repost the story you didn't just say this makes you sad you shared your own experience with uh, corporate bullying, um, which, uh, and like, as you just said, you, you mentioned uh, that it led you to having those kind of thoughts. So, so tell me, tell me the story. Um, tell me the story. Tell me what that experience was. Uh, yeah. Um, so before I, I actually did a uh, job transfer to same company, but a different location. And I liked the, the location that I was previously at. The issue was that I had a super busy manager and um, it was difficult to understand as a new employee and a recent college graduate, what my needs were and what were my opportunities for improvement when you have someone that's busy. Uh, it wasn't that she wasn't effective or anything. I just didn't know what to ask. I didn't know what I needed. So I saw an opportunity for a much smaller site. Um, and I thought my my perspective in going into that and applying for that role was that 
it's a smaller site. I can work intimately alongside of the quality manager and get the the tools and the resources that I wanted to grow. At that time, my goal was to become a vice president of quality. Uh, and I really wanted that one-on-one -on -one closeness. Um, I, I almost used it like Batman Robin when it came to like my manager and myself. Um, and when I had my interviews and went down to the site, that's how I was communicating. It was like this, this great thing. Um, and gosh, it just took a sharp turn. Um, it, it went from first just like, oh, you need to be more assertive in, in meetings. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to get my footing. I don't know really what to say. I'm not, because at that point, a lot of people were like cursing in the meetings and that's how they would, I guess, uh, the culture there where they would get attention or whatever. So I'm like, I, I don't, it's seven in the morning. I don't want to cuss nobody out. Like, I'm just trying to get whatever I need to get done. Um, so that was like the start of it, where it was just like these little things about who I am that was not okay anymore. Um, and then uh, it was getting closer to audit time. So we're inspecting various aspects of our quality management system. And um, the first part of it was I was tasked to work with an operator uh, to essentially learn about our heat treat processes. Uh, I was also going to help with like updating some code um, for the heat treat furnaces, the recipes. So again, to know these recipes, know like how to do these things, you have to work intimately with these operators um, to almost get in their mind on how are they doing these things? How are you setting these recipes? How do you know when a part is not um, at the quality level we needed to be. Um, so that was one start of what became uh, a labeled relationship was that I was literally tasked to work with someone and because of the manner and how we work together. So that meant me spending more time literally just sitting at the furnaces, asking questions, um, that became labeled as I was having an inappropriate relationship with this operator. So, yeah. So it started off as just a little rumor. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, corporate is high school with paychecks. I can deal with rumors. I don't care. But when it started to impact me was that um, I will, my office was directly across from my um, quality manager. Um, so I, every Friday I would just walk in there and we would have our conversations or what have you. So mornings were the same operator that I was learning from would come in and we would talk through, um, whatever was going on. I would close my door, but not all the way. Um, but that started, he got a text message from his supervisor. So another, um, salaried person, right. That's essentially in middle management where I am and he's like texting him about some alleged things inappropriate things that I'm doing with this operator in my office um which he screenshots that to me and I'm I'm just like what the hell this is the person you asked me to work with to learn alongside of and now it's become something altogether different um and then that led to literally me being removed from my office uh, and placed into like this bullpen area. So I didn't have the privacy of meeting with someone. Um, so that was one startup. <laughs> well, what, let me let me ask you there. Um, so you were moved, you were asked to vacate your office, move into a bullpen, uh, into a cube basically, right? Cubicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and was there any investigation? Were you given any reasons? Were you, it, it, they just heard rumors and decided to move you? Yeah. So basically he got that text and I want to say about the, let's say that you got that text on a Thursday. By that Monday, I was moved out of my office. 
Um, so I assume so, by him sharing that text with you, he was agreeing that like, obviously this is not happening, right? Like, yeah, he's like, what are they talking about? Like, and I, I'm just thinking, I have no idea. Like, I don't understand it, but whatever. Like, if that's what they want to think, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I never expected that to kind of result in me being moved out of, like, literally removed from my office. Like, pack your stuff up. Your stuff You're up. going in this other area. Um, and then the other area wasn't, um, it was probably the most hostile part for me. Um, so again, I'm the quality engineer and I'm working alongside of people within the engineering department um, to look at parts, disposition them, say what the issues are. Can we scrap this? Can we rework this? Do we need to enter a concession to our customer? Whatever the case is. And um, I, I moved into this like bullpen of people who are dealing more with uh, shipping of products, which is fine. Um, but I, I asked that, hey, if I'm working more with the people in the engineering department, which were mainly men, um, actually exclusively men, let me take that back, exclusively men. Um, yeah. How about I move in the area where they are since we're working together every morning um, and all of these things? And I was told, no, uh, you're going to stay here. And then the people that I'm working alongside of was literally a mother and her two daughters. So if the mother or one of the daughters felt any way about me, that got cascaded into the whole room. Um, so I would come into the room and I would because my my office so think of a square I'm like facing the mo outermost wall um and everyone has a corner so when I walk into the office I can see them having exchanges about me um while I'm sitting in the same place with them um and one of the conversations was like oh I think I'm better than them because I want to um, work in the engineering department and I I'm like I'm the quality engineer here I work exclusively with the engineering team and I help alongside of you guys but I think it would be more value if we have quality related problems for me to be alongside of engineering that was not the case um, then what else has happened so like um, part of my job was also to do these uh, first article inspection reports. And it's essentially like uh, a customer gives us a blueprint of a part and we want to ensure that we can make that part within the specified parameters that uh, the customer has given us. So it's essentially every couple years or every new part we'll get, we have to perform this inspection to make sure that our processes are compliant with the customer needs. So um, I essentially have to do that for every part or any changes that was happening. And the person whose job it was to review my paperwork in, in case there were any errors, or let's say if I uh, coded a part to a specific revision that wasn't the latest, he would say, hey, this is not the latest part revision, we should do this. Or if it's not the latest revision of a standard, it should be that. Um, so all of these conversations I'm just thinking are just opportunities for me to grow and learn more from him being that he was a more senior employee. Uh, what I didn't know is the year and some change that I was at this, this location, um, he kept a copy of it. Every single error I made, whether it was a space typo, if I fat fingered a K instead of an L, um, all of those were copied. So by the end of the year, um, I'm doing my performance review, my manager again. Uh, this was when our offices were right across from each other. And I met with him and I'm like, hey, actually, let me back up. Every Friday, I would meet with him. I had an impromptu meeting to just like say, hey, how am I doing? Like, uh, what are my opportunities for improvement? 
continuous improvement is not just something I learned. It's my lifestyle. So I always want to know, like, how can I be better? So every Friday I'm meeting with him. Only thing he kept saying to me was, you need to be more assertive. Okay. All right. I'll start saying F's and S's and cussing during the meetings. All right, cool. I'll be assertive. Yay. Um, so I'm meeting with him and around the time for my performance review, I'm get I meet with him and he states that I have met expectation, which is like a three or a four. I can't remember the scale, but it's like I'm meeting expectations, um, no opportunities are improvement, just the same jargon that I've been getting for the past six, seven months, whatever. So two weeks or so later, I get called into HR and I'm thinking that it's because we have a new person that's starting and maybe she just wants some time because it, it just popped up on my calendar. So I'm like, maybe she just wants to do a meet and greet. I don't know. I haven't seen her on the, on the site before, but essentially this person came from headquarters to tell me that I was placed on a, a PIP or a performance improvement plan uh, for failing to exceed uh, expectations. And I'm literally like, what are you talking about? I just met with my manager two weeks ago. Um, and he said I was doing great. And she proceeded to list uh, essentially uh, how I'm not a team player. Again, coming from the family that I was sitting in an office with, they were any, anything I did, they were reporting back um, and saying that I wasn't doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, so I'm not a team player. Um, I also learned that any error that I made, the person who reviewed it, mind you, it never made it to a customer. This is just internal review. Um, he has kept the copy of it with, for the past year and has presented that to uh, express that I'm incompetent for this job. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I just... Oh, yeah. Also, um, did not have a a good relationship with my manager. That was part of my PIP. So I had to improve my communication with him, which I'm like, I meet with this guy every Friday. What are you talking about? Um, I also learned during that session that I got complaints about from HR or from someone to HR that I came into work too early. Now, I work in aerospace. Yes, yes, too early. I work in aerospace manufacturing. We have three shifts. We have quality issues on each shift. The responsible thing to do is let me assess each shift at random to see what's happening to contribute to these quality related issues. I would come into work maybe. Um, four or five, right? Because I want to understand what's happening mid-shift. Or I may stay later to six or seven because that's second shift. So I'm trying to tap all three shifts. But literally, I will, I, the report stated that I came in to work early. The front office opens at seven. I need to be there at seven. And... I didn't even know that was an offense, less known an offense that should be reported and documented. Yeah. So um, I, it was just thing after thing after thing after thing. Yeah. So you were, you were placed in a cubicle with other women. Mm-hmm kept away from other, from your team because they were all men. Mm -hmm. um, is it uh, uh, any colleagues of color? No, I am the only uh, woman of color there uh, as far as engineering. We had a continuous improvement manager who was um, Hispanic, uh, but she didn't interact with the engineering department in the way that I did. 
uh, her interactions were separate in a way. Um, and I know that she wasn't treated well, but I can't communicate to what extent because me and her would have these conversations. Um, and I would vent to her a lot, uh, because that was like the only, um, female in a technical role that minority female in a technical role that was there. Um, and essentially there would be times where I'm an engineer and there, the people who were working for the engineering department, except for the engineering manager, were not engineers. Um, and what I mean by that, they did not obtain an engineering degree. They were in school. They were in, in a community college to get the prerequisites to go on to, uh, I guess, a traditional college or university to get their mechanical or what have you engineering degree. Um, so it'll be times where I would vent to the continuous improvement manager and letting her know, like, hey, I, I brought up the, the idea of, hey, let's check these, the tensile strength or what's the max pressure on these machines, all these things that I've studied. Uh, and I would get dismissed as if I didn't know what I was talking about. And um, one event that was jarring to me is that I asked these um, people in the engineering department about a max pressure for an extrusion machine that like creates this art. And um, I'm trying to understand at what point will we put too much pressure on this and it will fracture. These are aluminum and titanium extrusions. Um, nobody wants to hear what I have to say. And one day the part actually fractured. Uh, it literally went through the roof and landed two to 400 yards away from the plant. And that was one part. There was another part that um, they, however they designed it, when the operator put it uh, in that extrusion machine, the recoil in some way fired back and hit the operator in the head. Thankfully, he had his helmet on, but you're talking about a 1,500 pound piece of aluminum that's hitting someone. No safety offense, no safety write up. No near miss, um, wasn't reported to HR, uh, no discipline for neither, neither thing. But me having typos that never made it to our customer was an offense that needed to be documented. Wow. So I'm dealing with that, right? I'm going back and forth talking to her like, what the hell is going on? Like, these are typos and we almost killed somebody on more than one occasion. And none of these have been dealt with at the gravity or the magnitude that I am dealing with. I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, that would be certainly a hard thing to understand. And and something that you had mentioned in your um, LinkedIn post is, you know, a, a Again, to just reiterate, I mean, you have a, a degree in engineering um, and the, but we're dismissed as not knowing what, and as you mentioned, not knowing what you're talking about, but your colleagues did not have a degree. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned, you know, uh, additional um, bullying about wanting when you asked and requested to improve yourself. Can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, at this time, I this was before I started my master's. I had just got accepted into Eastern Michigan. And what led me to um, pursue this uh, degree in quality was that one of my previous mentors um, went to the same university. She graduated with the same program and she eventually worked her way to becoming the VP of quality. So I wanted to follow her steps. And um, 
essentially I got accepted to Eastern Michigan University and I'm very excited. Uh, again, I'm still working for the same company. I just did a site transfer. So they stated, hey, when you do your site transfer, um, bring up your tuition and all that to them since you'll now be uh, an employee there. Cool. So as I'm interviewing, uh, I brought this up and uh, it was mentioned during my interviews, uh, once I got my offer and all that, like, hey, I'm going to school for these things. It contributes directly to the roles that I want to have within this this business. Um, will it be supported? And I got a yes. So once I started and I started school, I want to say um, August or May of that, that same that same year or year before, um, And I'm just seeing, like, what's the process to go through tuition reimbursement? Um, I'm doing a couple classes. It's not maxing out. I think the the credit or reimbursement was like $5,250 a year. So I'm ensuring that I I hover below that. Um, And every time I meet with HR, my manager, uh, or even the plant manager to talk through like, hey, how do what's the process of me getting the tuition reimbursement? Um, I was always told they never had the funds. Um, and I'm like, all right, it's not ideal, but okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll just pay out of pocket for my master's. Cool, whatever. But I learned through, again, I would have these morning meetings with these same guys to go over parts and all of that. Uh, I learned from them that the site was covering the four guys who did not have an engineering degree. Um, They're covering their tuition uh, for the classes that they're taking, their calculus. I think they were taking like calculus, geometry, all all the levels, the prerequisite courses to get into, um, into a university. And I was just like, so yeah, I don't have money for me. Cool. And that kind of was confirmed. Uh, so once I am learning more about the problems that we're having, it's a lot of part variation. So I'm like, maybe we should do a green belt or a Lean Six Sigma project to like reduce the variation in these parts. So I'm learning more about Lean Six Sigma and I asked my manager, um, hey, there's this Lean Six Sigma training. It's a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars. I couldn't remember. No, it was like 1800. I take it back. Um, So I'm like, it's like 1800 bucks. Can I go to it? Like, can you guys help me or sponsor it? And this was like, I've asked him during our one-on-ones and he was like, I'll, I'll think about it. Um, give me some time. I said, okay. So I wait some time because his deadline is vastly approaching. So then we're like having this meeting or going to have a meeting. So we get there early and it's just at that time, it's just me and him. Um, and I, I asked him um, and people are starting to walk in, but we're just standing alone having a conversation and I said hey the timeline for this training is approaching like will you guys be able to cover the Lean Six Sigma training for me um like I just want to know what to do and like again people are filling in the room and he's like trainings cost money and he just yells that at me he's like no trainings cost money I said no and I'm like what (laughs) I'm like what is happening first my daddy lives in St. Louis like who are you yelling at (laughs) like you're not my parent right where is this coming from um and two I'm like horrified because I it's a whole room full of people at this point and you just yelled at me to the top of your lungs um so I sat there like Try, you know, like how you want to cry, but you like, okay, suck it up. Don't cry right now. It's a room full of people. 
I'm going to wait till I get to my office or a bathroom. Mm -hmm. I can't cry right now. So you're going to pinch yourself, do whatever, so you don't cry in that moment. Um, And again, I have my my laptop with me and I get a a chime and it's like the engineering manager. And he's like, hey, are you okay? And I'm just like, no, I'm not okay. This guy just yelled at me like, like I'm a child. So I eventually just paid for the training out of pocket um, and just stopped. Like, it just felt like any moment that I was trying to improve myself or find ways to make sure I was creating value or finding ways to create value, it was just a problem. So I started to feel like, is it me? Am I the problem? And um, it got to the point where every other day it was something new about what I was doing. Um, and I'm on this pip and I'm, I'm just trying to like check the boxes. So I'm being nice to the mom, more nice, like, like just trying to go above and beyond to like these room of mom and her two daughters, you know, I'm like, Hey, do y'all need anything? Um, like I even asked one lady like the mom one day because I just was like so overwhelmed I was like hey can you just pray with me because she had all these crosses up I'm like can you, can you just pray with me like I'm I just feel like overwhelmed and I can't not cry right now like just I'm just trying to like I'm human just see me uh and she's like nice to me and she prays with me and then the next week is back to the same thing where it's like, she doesn't like me. Her daughters don't like me and they'll have conversations around me. Um, and I'm hearing chimes going back and forth and people are laughing. Um, but I'm not, I'm not engaged. There, there's no, Hey diamond outside of that one time where we had this moment, nothing. I'm like trying to bring up movies. I'm trying to, how can I connect with y'all? Like, what can I do? Um, but yeah, so it, it just was like, I started having really, really bad panic attacks, like just pulling up in a parking lot. I would just cry. I would just sit like head and steering wheel, just like boohooing. And then I'm like, okay, diamond, suck it up. Let's make it through the day. And like the one person who was like, consistently nice to me was the same operator that I lost my office on so like I'm trying to like interact with him and engage with him because he's nice to me actually it was a lot of the operators on the floor that were very nice to me um that would hey are you okay you look a certain way like is everything okay and I would get that anytime I stepped on the floor uh, I would sit there and like listen to the operators, hear what the issues are, and try to be their voice because they weren't getting listened to either, right? So, in my first job ever uh, was I was an intern uh, at an automotive manufacturing company, and I had an operator come to me my first day. I'm walking through the plant, just trying to understand it, and he's like, "Hey." I know that you're going to go get your degree and you're going to be this engineer thing, but I need you to know you're not better than us. And I need you to know that these operators know these machines and they can break it to the point where maintenance will know how to fix it. So don't let your degree make you treat us like you're better than us because that's what everyone else did. And I always took, I, I don't even remember that guy's name. I don't think he even gave me his name. But I always took that piece of advice, no matter how it was delivered, it was the fact that, like, I'm never going to go out of my way to belittle or make um, operators or people who are actually hands-on with the product to make them feel like they don't know what, what's going on. I'm always going to find a way to include these people and make sure that I can advocate for them. 
Um, so like I spent a lot of time just on a shop floor because if there's quality problems, you and this manual aren't going to teach me anything. I need to be with the people who are building these parts, who knows that if this machine makes a high pitched squeal for too long, oh, it needs this. I want to be alongside of those people. I know what these offices and cubicles and these titles say, yeah, that's great. But the people who keep the life and the blood of these organizations are the people that's building these things. I want to learn from them. And that, for some reason, wasn't received at this organization. So anytime that I spent time with the operators um, who were men or, yeah, it, it was very rarely any women operators. It was mainly men. So anytime I'm spending time with these male operators is perceived a certain way because I'm a woman not me just trying to learn my job or do my job it's um I'm doing something inappropriate which was just exhausting it's tiring I can certainly empathize with with that Uh, I think most (laughs) women most women can unfortunately but um you know, Diamond, tell me, you know, you, you mentioned you empathized uh, with this um, VP of Student Affairs with uh, Dr. Antoinette, with Bonnie, uh, about, you know, her choice to commit suicide. Uh, and you talked a little bit about how you can, you know, why, you know, staying for so long and, and choosing that. And um, so how did you work through those feelings and that empathy and you know and you know why did you keep trying why did you keep staying like what 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 are your thoughts going through and what are you dealing with there yeah um I stayed because at that time I didn't feel like I had an escape so um I'm in my 20s I I'm living in another state. My parents aren't there. I literally had just bought a house. So I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't, I don't have any place to go to. I have to figure it out. Like I have to make it work. I was applying for other jobs. Um, I was trying to find it out any way possible. I had conversations with HR um, just like, Hey, help me. What can I do? Like, how can I make it more bearable? Um, and like nothing worked out. So I, I'm just trying to show up, cry in my car, do my best, um, and whatever I could. And, um, so I'm on this, this pip. Let me go back to that. Cause it kind of, yeah, frames everything. I'm on, it was a six week pip where I had six weeks to improve or I was getting fired. So I got on the PIP, I want to say in October. Yeah, October or something like that. I don't know. Um, And it was supposed to end in November. I remember that specifically. Um, And what ended up happening is I'm trying to follow this subjective rubric of like what I'm doing wrong um, to the T. And like November comes and nothing happens. So I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. December comes, nothing happens. Okay, maybe I'm doing great. January comes nothing happens right I'm like man all right so maybe I'm doing right maybe something maybe something I did was maybe it was me maybe I don't know like okay maybe I'm I'm changing maybe they like me now January 30th 2019 2 15 p.m central standard time I get a alert from HR I'm like okay I don't like these random HR pop-ups on my calendars. All right. So I'm going into the office and I'm like, all right, my PIP ended six weeks ago or three months ago. I should be good. Like maybe they're telling me, you know, great job or whatever. 
No, they fired me. Um, oh. They fired me. And after like spending some time and thinking through it, they literally kept me through vacations um, so that people could take their time off and I could do their work. Um, and then once everyone was back by like the end of January, Diamond was gone. So um, that actually turned out to be the biggest blessing in my life because Again, I was always on this continuous improvement mind frame. So months prior, I had applied to Bryce University for a data analytics bootcamp because I'm starting this Lean Six Sigma thing. I want to learn more about coding and like, how do I improve these parts? Because we had like eight product escapes. It was just a really bad time. So I'm trying to figure out like, how can I improve? I need to learn coding. Literally, the boot camp started, again, I got fired January 30th. It started, I want to say that was a Friday. The boot camp started that Monday. So I'm like, Diamond, what are you going to do? Are you going to just cry every day or you're just going to do something else? So I showed up to the boot camp and I told them like, hey, I lost my job. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay for it. Can y'all work with me? And they did. Uh, so I did that boot camp for six months. I was unemployed for eight months. So during that eight months, I was in therapy because after dealing with them, you need it. Actually, I was in therapy during all of it. But yeah, so I was in therapy. I'm going through this boot camp, applying for jobs, just trying to get into this data space I didn't know where in this data space I just wanted to land somewhere um and get like I love aerospace manufacturing I love it I literally have ISO standards saved in my phone from aerospace manufacturing and I occasionally read them that is my when it comes to like aerospace manufacturing I really really like it um yeah I'm weird for that I'll accept it um <laughs> But what ended up happening was um, eight months later, I land a job as a data engineer. I don't even know what the hell that is, um, but I land this job and like that job led me to everything else that I've been doing. Um, so as horrible as that story was, I needed it. Um, I needed to see one that I don't need people to treat me that way and I don't have to like work my way for them to not treat me that way it's either you like me or you don't you respect me or you don't you can't make someone do it like no matter what you do and I learned that even when you try your hardest they're going to keep moving the goalposts so it's like you might as well just accept who you are be who you are and if they don't like it oh well like and that's been my mentality um going forward um as well as i genuinely have tried to not be in organizations where I'm the only person of color um and that is I don't I don't know how to say this but I'm gonna just say it it's it is not a badge of honor to be the first um you have a weight of the past and the present that no one really understands so Presently, you have to represent your culture, whatever that is, your your race, whoever, your identity, you're, you're that for everyone. And then you also have to be cognizant of, oh, I have to do so great at this. That they want more people that look like me. Why would I want that weight? I don't right. want it ever again, because yeah. you can never be fully present. You always have to be on this pendulum of like, Am I doing enough where they'll hire more people like me? And am I representing the whole of me? Work. I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. You just want to be you. That's, be recognized that's for your it. skills, right? <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. If I mess up, I want it to be diamonds mess up, not black women, black engineer women, but mm -hmm. I don't want it to represent anything past me. 
if I mess up, let it be my fault. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've often, um, been the token woman. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I can, I can relate on, on that level. Um, so tell me, Diamond, I mean, this is great advice, you know, so how, what additional advice do you have for people who are struggling with bullying, uh, corporate bullying, um, struggling with racism, sexism, um, uh, and, uh, you know, how, what advice do you have to give to anybody dealing with that currently? Um, I'll start with, it's not you. I'll just start with that because um, sometimes it's just people are humans are shitty at times. Like that's, that's it. Like, and even if you mess up, even if you do, nothing warrants being bullied. Like we're not robots. We're going to mess up and robots mm -hmm. mess up. You get what I'm So it's like, mm -hmm. it's not you. So let's mm -hmm. start there. Always keep your resume updated. Always, like, always, always, always. Um, network. Network with people outside of your organization. Um, and the biggest piece I would give anyone is build your own brand. Um, I have been very intentional about that for the past seven, eight years after this happened. Because um, a part of me proverbially died when um, I saw that I was giving everything that I could to this business or this organization. And that meant nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and if I continue to place my identity on how a corporate organization is going to treat me, how I feel about myself will continue to fluctuate. So build something outside of my job. So people know me not for working at any company that I work for. A lot of people know me for being diamond. Um, and that is what gets me in rooms and in conversations that I didn't know existed, not because of my, and I, I don't want to say this as like um, the millennial who job hops, but I don't have that loyalty to organizations like that they don't have it to us um so it's like I treat it as a transactional arrangement you know it's a if then condition for me if I do this then I'll keep my job if I don't then I probably may need to look around or if y'all treat me this way then I may have to look around so um I think like those are the the pieces of advice that has kept me just knowing that like it's not me and even if it is me does it warrant this degree of treatment did I hurt someone no did I intentionally or have malice intent towards anyone no okay then we can work with it next I'm going to network I'm going to build my brand have people getting to know me I'm going to continuously build my skill set um, make myself marketable uh, because again there is no loyalty and sometimes humans are shitty even if you really really like your job you can get a new manager tomorrow who is not friendly yeah. or who has expectations for you that you don't have you know yeah. and they're not communicated so it's like there's a lot of variables in these equations that we don't control. So it's like, how can you control what you can control? Like I can control, you know, my network and who I get to know. I can control my resume and the experiences that I try to have, whether it's outside of my job in a volunteer capacity, whatever, I can control that. I can control how people feel about me, no matter how hard I try. But I can always do my best to try to find people who feel the same way about my about me that I do, or at least um, 
is indifferent. <laughs> like, you know, I can I can deal with that. You don't know how to feel about me. I can deal with that. But if you've already committed yourself to feeling a way about me, I can't do anything about that. That's great advice. And, and Diamond, do you have any advice for somebody who is witnessing uh, bullying at work? And how can, or advice for how to become an advocate and adversary uh, for somebody? Yeah, I think the advice I would give is speak up. Um, witness, talk through what you witnessed um, and realize that you are not different. <laughs> you are not special. That mm -hmm. That can be you too. Um, and I think if people have that mentality as they watch situations, especially in the social media age, um, that the world is circular, where yeah. something can come back in another form and these aren't isolated incidents. I think people would be more um, willing to not just be a bystander when it comes to seeing something that is hateful and that goes out of their way to hurt someone intentional hurt we're going to hurt humans unintentionally just because we're humans we have different experiences we can work past that but intentionally going out of your way to hurt someone speak up about it great advice any resources uh on that people you can recommend to educate on these issues or or find out more and how to just be better um just listen that that's what I would start with um I will also say uh text 988 which is like a suicide hotline number um if you're having those thoughts uh text call those people listen I've I called it several times during that you know when it was a much longer number than that um when it was when I was in the thick of it and just having someone to just listen matters. Mm -hmm. Like, just listen. Um, resources and um, Melinda Hart, oh, I can't think of her book, but her name is Melinda Hart and she has a, a book. It's something about workplace. I can't think of it, but I would say that, um, dang, I can't think of that book's title now. Okay, we can look it up certainly yeah <laughs> yeah I can't think of it um she does a really good job of like highlighting what uh the minority experience is um as a black woman in these spaces um I can't speak to any other identities or ethnic groups outside of my own um because those are the resources that I primarily look for diamond oh my gosh what a story. Thank you. Um, thank you for so much for, for being willing to share. Um, I hope, uh, you know, people hear and listen and, 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 you know, I think I hope we're moving as a society towards, you know, feeling empowered to speak up more, yeah. um, and to say more and to stand up for, better behavior because as you so yeah I hope so too the book is called the memo by uh, Minda Hart perfect the memo okay yeah awesome um well again I just thank you so much <laughs> I can't thank you yeah. enough I just so have, have so much appreciation for you um, thank you for getting vulnerable with us and, and talking through this and, and it, it means a lot and, and, uh, it means a lot that you trusted me to, uh, personally to, to share this story, to help share this story. I appreciate, so. um, being asked to share, it. um, I haven't, I've shared parts of it, but I, I've never shared in totality what I went through in that like two years that I worked there well I am sorry for what you went through um but I am grateful that you are 
uh, using it in such a positive way and, and finding yeah. finding uh, resources from that. So thank you. No thank you. No and thanks for everything you do. You are a powerhouse woman. I gotta <laughs> tell you, man. Like you are no slouch. Constantly <laughs> learning through it all. Like just, I'm just gonna keep going through my masters. And while I'm doing <laughs> a couple of certificates, you know, just <laughs> like you are amazing. You yeah, are you, really amazing. You know, like I appreciate it. One one piece of the. <laughs> I would say advice. One one thing that I did get from that same manager was like, uh, I'm too ambitious and idealistic. And I was like, bet I will wow. take that any day. Right? <laughs> wow. Like, why is that a crime? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Oh well, keep it up. I, I love that ambition. <laughs> like <laughs> me too hey I gotta yeah that's just who I am <laughs> yeah. you know I, I gotta tell you you know in data and, and talking to so many people now about their careers ambition and the constant curiosity and wanting to learn is the core of so what makes us successful right it yeah makes us good at what we do is so I, I just believe that it I do I believe that as well and I I also have experience. So now I believe that there's a lot of people who view that in a negative way because um, they are insecure and don't want that exposed. They know a certain set of skills and anything past that, don't touch it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, again, Diamond, <laughs> thank you. And, and and I'll we'll we'll post all the link to your uh website and, and that kind of thing as well and to the previous podcast. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Oh, and to all of our listeners out there, thank you for listening to this episode today. And if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in podcasts and the latest data management education, you can go to dataversity net for slash subscribe and i will say as always to end this podcast stay curious people get be aware stay curious continue learning and let's uh make everybody's careers a little bit easier Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.